Well, we are continuing on in our series titled, Be Encouraged. And we're going through Philippians. And the last time we met, we went through Philippians chapter 1. And the title of that message was, Let's Do Ministry Together. And if you remember, I gave you some homework. I'm wondering how that turned out for you. So we talked about remembering each other, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week and be in prayer for each other. And so I, I, I asked if maybe you'd open up the directory and start at the beginning and open up and get one name and pray for that person or family and open up in the middle, open up in the end, and kind of do that throughout. How did that turn out for you, church? It's a blessing, wasn't it? I'm hoping that silence is not an indication of anything there, that maybe, maybe you're just breathing. Maybe everyone took a drink at that time. I'm not sure. Second thing I told you about, and we talked about, about being encouraged is not only remembering each other and praying for each other, but that we would also remind each other of our future hope. Not, not just who we are today, but who we are today in Christ and what we will be someday. And so there was all kinds of encouragement in that. Today we continue on in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2, today's title of the message is to be like-minded, be encouraged, be like-minded. And so that goes along with serving together and, and doing ministry together. we got to be like-minded together. Like-minded as in one accord, one mind, one love. And so as I was getting ready and preparing, I thought maybe we'd just do something a little different this morning just to get you going. And you know what? It just might work because you were really nice and quiet on that last part there. So who here has a bulletin? Raise it up. Everybody got a bulletin? Got to get the bulletin. The bulletin tells you everything's going on in the church and upcoming events and all that stuff. So what I want to do is I want to talk about like-mindedness, and I want to do our own little version of like a newlywed game. We got any couples in the room here today? Couples? Listen, if you were here today, let's pick teams. If you're here today and, and you've been married for 50-plus years, would you raise your hands? 50... There's a lot of hands. This is awesome. Look at that. 50 plus years, you're one team. <laughs> All together. <laughs> I'm not even sure why that was funny. 25 years or more, raise your hand. Great. What? <laughs> you guys will work on this. Don't worry. <laughs> Five years or more, raise your hand. Five years or more. Okay, we got our third group. One year. Okay, I'm going to even include into the one year if you're just thinking about it. You're, you're like, uh, you're engaged. One year or engaged. Raise your hand. Okay, fantastic. We got our teams. Here's what I'm going to do. You've got, your, you've got your bulletin there. I'm going to ask three questions. What I want each couple to do with, separately from each other, do not cheat in church. <laughs> Wait till you get to the car or something. You know what I'm saying? But don't cheat in church. I'm going to ask you three questions. How I want you to answer question number one is answer, as you're reading it, how I would answer. Not me personally. It's not about me. Like, if you're a husband, how you would answer this question for yourself. But then the second part of it is, what do you think she's going to say? Okay, what's her answer? I'm going to give you an example. What's your favorite color? And you know your favorite color, and you'll write that down. But what's your spouse's or your significant other? What's their favorite color? And you'll write that down. Again, no talking during this. You ready? Now, don't share answers until we're done here, and then we'll find out who the winner is in our church. Okay? Question number one. Are we ready? What's your favorite animal? What's your favorite animal? Write down your answer and the answer you think your spouse says. Like, this is my favorite animal. We've got to go quickly here. I've got to move this service along, so we're off to question number two here. What is the one goal you want to reach this year? What's the one goal that you want to reach this year? Oh, it's tough. Come on, we're in, we're in May. You better already know what your goal is for the year. What's your goal? And then underneath it, what's your significant other? What's their goal? I can already tell some of you are looking, going, why would he ever do this to us? 
Question number three. What's your favorite Bible verse? Favorite Bible verse. What would your spouse say? Okay, here we go. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, with your spouse, I want you to compare answers. If, if you've got both answers right on question one, you get one point. Then go to two. If you got another one right, you got a second point. A third, you get three points in there. I'll give you about a minute here to go through this and grade yourselves. Time's up. I lied. <laughs> How are we doing? Did anybody... Oh, I'll give it 30 more seconds. Here we go. I'll be kind. Anybody get one right? Show of hands. Did you get one right? Okay, I see. Now, listen. One right. Did anybody get two right? Hands up. Hands up. All right, we've got a... Ba- what happened to the balcony? Two right, um, three right, raise your hand. Is there a hand? Oh, right here, congratulations, nice job. Three right, there you go. And so, that is fantastic. And so with that, you know, you just look at it and you think, okay, 50 plus years married, Certainly the advantage there is that they have had a lot of years to talk with each other and and to get to know each other. But the same could be said about somebody that's even considering getting married because they spend all that time talking on the phone and texting and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all of these different things out there. You have the opportunity to, to communicate with each other. There's downsides to both. You could be married 50 years and 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 not only the marriage, but things like work or things like church all of a sudden become routine and you stop asking the questions and stop talking. So if you're here today and maybe you didn't get all three, the encouragement is spend the afternoon having a conversation. What's your favorite animal? What's your favorite Bible verse? Ask the questions. If you're brand new and considering getting married, Find out what that other person is interested in and spend some time together. Philippians chapter 2. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now God's word has gone forth and it shall accomplish that for which he purposed on this place, this day, for these folks listening in and those listening at home as well. Do you believe that to be true, church? Say amen. 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 Paul says, be like-minded, one accord, one mind, one love. Church, if we were to gather all of the things and ask all of the questions, can we agree what is the center point of our faith? Who is it? What is the one thing that our faith is built on? Jesus. He is the center point of it. And so I want to start there that you have to have Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of all things in your life. That's where the encouragement comes from. There's where the like-mindedness comes from. Is that we always have to go back to Christ at the center. Listen, you're perhaps considering getting married, having a relationship, like-minded, Christ at the center. 
What happens if, if, if Christ isn't at the center and, and you start to go a, a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years, and everything seems fantastic and fine now, but then you hit this crossroads, you hit some difficulties, and one of you goes one way towards Christ and the other goes another way. How can there be like-mindedness? How can you solve this? How can you work through this together if it isn't centered on Christ? Let me encourage you here today. Let your relationships be centered on Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've already made that choice and you're in a a relationship, in a marriage that, that the centerpiece isn't Christ, get Christ as your center. And you keep going to the Lord as your center. And in God's timing, we'll pray, we'll continue to pray that the Lord will bring your spouse along as well. But Christ likeness in relationships. Church, is that important? Christ-centered in work. Everything I do, is it for the Lord? Is it to bring glory to God in the workplace? What happens if if Christ has nothing to do with your work outside of church and and you're going along and, and, and you're working and you know what, I love my job and this and that and then all of a sudden you go in one day and they give you a pink slip and say you're done here today. If it's not Christ-centered, you'll be devastated. But if it's Christ-centered and you get up and you say, listen, I'm going to serve the Lord today. I'm going to serve others today. I have the privilege of, of, of earning some, some money for my support of my family and to raise them up. And I come into work today and they say, you're done. Today is your last day. I'll still go to the next place. Christ-centered. I'll serve God here. I'll serve others here. I'll support my family here. Christ-centered. Church is it important in the workplace. They have Christ-centered. Church, how about ministry? Christ-centered. It seems like such an obvious place that, that Christ should just be at the center, but it is something that in our world can get away from churches and you ask people, go ahead and just ask people this week from various different churches, how's your church doing? And you know what you'll likely hear? Well, we got about 300, we got about 450 showed up yesterday. This is when I asked, how's your church doing? Well, we're up to five services on the weekend. How's your church doing? 17 campuses. How's your church doing? We're a smaller church. Everybody's like family. They get to know. How is your church doing? We're like-minded. Christ is at the center. And everything flows from it. Listen, if the church doesn't have Christ at the center, it is just a social gathering. It's a country club. And you're not going to get encouraged. Church, Munster Church, do we want Christ at the center of this church? Amen. Amen. Christ at the center. You're like, well, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we make sure? God's not going to just leave you to figure this out on your own. So in another letter that Paul is writing, he says, I therefore, in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, the first six verses of chapter of Ephesians 4, first six verses. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Remember calling. To which you have been called. There it is a second time. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. How are we going to do this? How are we going to have this like-mindedness? It comes from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who is around all of us, working through us and in us. The like-minded is there. I don't want to hear, I, I, I've always been this way, I've always been opinionated, and I'm, I, I've got my rights and my decision. I, I don't want to hear it. 
Tired of hearing that from Christians. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. It's no longer you who live, but it's Christ Jesus who lives in you. Why would we ever take him out of the center? He's in you. And he's the one that calls us. Nobody comes to faith without his calling. Why would we ever remove him from the center of our church, center of our lives, church? It's God. Paul says, be an encouragement to each other. You're waiting to be encouraged, but be an encouragement to other people. In other scriptures, in 1 John chapter 1, you have the followers of Jesus Christ writing that that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have walked with and talked with and ate with, and and, in this promised coming Messiah, He's here with us, and we have done all of this with Him, and, and we want to share it with you so that you could be encouraged, so that you could join us in the fellowship. Paul says, encourage one another. Be like-minded. Keep Christ at the center and be an encouragement to other people. The opposite of the like-mindedness is incompatible. And incompatible is defined as being opposed in character, unable to live together harmoniously. And I'll tell you, if you're incompatible, you're going to lose the encouragement. Like I said, you'll go a little ways down the road and hardship's going to hit and one's going to go one way and the other's going to go another way. You may run into decisions in the workplace and, 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 and if, it, if you're not compatible, if Christ isn't at the center, one may go this way and one may go that way. Where is the encouragement? Church, if, if Christ isn't at the center and we're not, we're not like-minded but we're incompatible and, and decisions have to be made in a church and, and one part of it goes this way and another goes this way, what happens? Where is the encouragement there? We have to be like-minded. The incompatible part of it all is that what starts to take place there is selfishness. See, you could be like-minded and decisions don't go your way and you're like, it don't matter, Christ is at the center. But incompatible, I have a right. I've been going to this church for all of these years and I get to say what I want and, and do what I want. And that's where selfishness starts to creep in and, and pride. And in Scripture, you read in Ephesians chapter 2, Christ come to break down these walls of hostility. Christ come to break down this dividing wall so that it all could be one together. But little bit by little bit, our world is putting the wall back up. There's no room in the church. There's no room in our lives for this incompatibility. There should be no pride. Pride comes before the fall, church. That's how the evil one got kicked out. You go back to the garden and you look and they walked and talked with God and they had everything they could possibly want right there. You, you, all the food you could ever want, it's provided. Pure air, provided great health, provided fruitful living, generation after generation. Listen, you have, com- you have company here too. God provided everything. You just can't go here. You can't participate in this one thing. And what do they do? And they start thinking, I'm missing something. I'm entitled to something. And pride gives in. They don't think about what it's going to do for other people. In that moment, it seems right for them. Not how it'll affect generation after generation after generation after generation, all the way till we sit here in Munster Church today. They make a decision that was good for them. Church, how many times do we do that where we'll step into something and, and, and it's like, listen, this is going to bring me instant gratification and bring me some happiness. But you don't realize the consequences. You don't realize how this will affect so many people around you. 
Again, you go back to that, that situation where you're choosing maybe who you're going to spend your entire life with. And yeah, but I like this person. They like me. I like them. And, and you don't give consideration how this is going to affect everybody else. What's going to happen when you get married and, and you're going in separate directions here and you have a child and you want to raise your child up in your faith and your spouse says, no. Church, we celebrated this morning a, a, a couple that's, that's compatible, a couple that is like-minded who brings a child together and there's no, there's no discussion about it. This child will be baptized. This child will be raised up in this church. I wonder this. I wonder how the story would have looked a little different Adam and Eve, before they make that disastrous decision, if they would have just asked the question of themselves, how will this affect others, not just me? What if in that moment the God who would walk and talk with them, if they just called Him over and said, God, during this time, although we're tempted by this, we want to spend this time. You've given us this blessing. You've given us this blessing. You've given us this blessing. We just want to praise You right now for all that we do have. Would You strip away from us this thought of what we can't have? How would that have been different, church? Let me ask you. And this is homework number one for you this week. And we're going to wrap up relatively soon here, but homework number one. This week, I want you to consider your blessings one by one. And yeah, there's things that you want that you're not getting. But you don't have to give in to it. Go to the Lord. Say, Lord, You've blessed me here. You've blessed me here. You've blessed me here. Church, I think we spend too much time thinking about what we don't have instead of spending time thinking about what we do have and what the Lord's blessed us with. And so this week I'd ask you, I'm going to ask myself, just keep going back to the Lord. Lord, you've blessed us with so much. There's a second part to the homework right there, and I would ask you this, to keep an eye, because I want you to, to see this out there, because it's very subtle, and it's around us, and I don't know that we often pick up on it, but there is this incompatibility in this world that's going on around us. Last week, I dropped Molly off for worship practice before Sunday church, and before I headed out to my mom's church to, to spend Mother's Day with her, I went to this public place and just sat, and I had some things I wanted to do and think through, and, and as I was sitting there. I heard one lady sitting talking to another lady. And the whole time, all she did, the one lady was just talk about how this other person did this wrong and how they did that wrong. And you wouldn't believe how they acted. And oh, and they dressed like this and this and that. And they went on as if, if, if the person would just be them, they would be solve the world. If everybody could just be me. And of course, what that feeds into is not the other person going, no, I think you're wrong. The other person starts to agree with them and starts to tell them and then goes, you know what, that's like this. And they go and tell their story. And there they go, talking about all of these things. You see that happening around you? I've stood in, I've stood in lines at the store and they don't even know you're there as they're ringing you out. They're trash talking somebody else that works there. Been in a workplace where they're trash talking uh, the boss. I've been in, in, in churches where they're trash talking this. Where, yeah, it happens in churches. Be observant of it. And then I'm, here's the homework part. Ready? I want you to inject some encouragement into that conversation. And yeah, that'll be fun. But I want you to do it. I'm telling you, I've seen this happen over and over again. I see it all the time. Here's the easy targets if you want to look for easy targets to, to see this going on where people just bring up all the negatives about. Listen to people talking about in laws this week. My mother in law, my mother in law, ah, oh, my mother in law. Every time I hear that, I'm like, I've got to tell you about my mother in law. 
And I love her. Oh, but you don't understand. I eat a couple days a week with my mother-in-law. Oh, I love my mother-in-law. You don't understand. She lives in the same neighborhood, and we, we, we run into each other often. You don't understand. Listen, I love my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law lives in my backyard. Not actually in the backyard. I should clear that up. <laughs> yeah, right? She's like in a tree house. <laughs> Zip line to our house. No, she has a house in the back. But you know what happens when you say, I love my mother, and you inject the encouragement into it? You'll hear somebody else go, you know what, yeah, I kind of like my mother-in-law too. Walk into rooms and you hear people talking about their spouses, inject the encouragement. Talking about their kids, inject the encouragement. Talking about their church, inject the encouragement. Church, we need to be like-minded, Christ at the center. We have to be careful of this incompatibility that's running wild in our country and, and, and behind the scenes is working to divide and put up these walls. And as they're going to speak, they're having you hold the wall while they knock that in. You just put your hands on, I'm not holding the wall. Inject some encouragement into that conversation. Now listen, God's not going to tell you in His Word to be like-minded and to put others first and not tell you how to do it or to give you an example. So there in Philippians chapter 2, you find the greatest example of them all. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who, although He's God, does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, he sees the need before the foundation of the world that that poor decision made in the garden would separate us for all eternity from this holy God of ours. And so Christ decides to come here to be God and to be man. Put on flesh that He would live for you, that He would die for you, that He would rise again for you to give you life. He did not count equality a thing to be grasped. He was humble. He was not filled with pride when he came here. The creator, the most treasured, the most perfect, the most, you can fill it in, the most everything came here to be nothing. Came here to be of no reputation. And when he puts on flesh, he could have been a man, this grand ruler here, ruling the nations. And that's what we would have created if we got the opportunity. Make Christ this ruling, conquering king here. And so many in Scripture miss his coming because that's what they're looking for. But yet he comes humble. He's a servant. He puts others first. And he takes that to a cross. This lowest form of death. This cross that's marked out for the shamed. This cross that is marked out for the guilty. He goes there for you, and he goes there for me. Didn't consider who he was, something to be grasped. Church, what if this week you didn't worry so much about your status. What if you didn't worry about what others would think? You didn't worry about how prominent you were. You didn't worry about how your finances were. You didn't worry about educational status. You didn't worry about, you didn't worry about, will I be the most popular person? What if all you did, you set all that aside and you said, listen, I'm going to be just like Christ this week. How will this life impact others like Christ impacted others. It's a struggle every day, church. Every day I get up and, and, and I lead a company. And, I, and I'm telling you this not for prideful purposes, but to tell you the, the struggles I'll go through every single day. Leading a company every day. There's part of me that just feels great about the opportunity to be the leader of this company. But you got to watch yourself so you don't get prideful. You don't enter into the day. This is what I said. You do it because I'm who I am here. That's on one end you got to guard against. The other end over here is I'm not good enough. Think too high of myself, think too low of myself. I'm not capable of doing this. 
I don't have all of the credentials for doing this job. As a matter of fact, a couple, a couple weeks back, I told you how I went to Arizona and they put me on a mountain and, and I walked, well, I kind of rolled down the mountain a little bit, right? And when I went to that meeting, it was a whole bunch of people. The, the person that was mentoring is this well-known speaker. This person has authored many books, led many companies to success, multi-millionaires. And there's going to be all these other leaders of my status in this room that are walking and talking together and learning together. And I told my boss, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to fit in there. And you know what he told me? Oh, this is going to be encouraging. He says, Jim, when you go there, I hope you're the dumbest one in the room. How's that supposed to help? <laughs> he said, if you're the dumbest one in the room, you'll have the most to learn. I said, fantastic. There is such a difference between being the prideful and being so down on yourself. you got to meet in the middle. Don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think too low of yourself. I got this. Don't even think of yourself. When you step into the workplace, when you step into your neighborhood, when you step into your family life this week, when you step into ministry, when you step into school, Christ at the center. What can He do with this life? Church, that, that, that passage ends with, he is exalted. You know, we could talk about being on the cross and, 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 and the humble and the servant, but he is exalted. He has been given the name above all names, names in heaven and earth and under the earth. That at one, na- one day, at the name of Jesus Christ, every name, every person, every voice will pronounce Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow. He's exalted. And so too you, if if we keep Christ at the center, if you do away with all this incompatibility in our lives and, and you're doing things for other people and you step into your day and you say, how can God take this life and do something magnificent for His kingdom purposes to reach people? Trust me, you will be encouraged, church. You'll be encouraged today. And if you don't see it today, one day, like little Oliver will stand before the Lord and he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we will be encouraged for all eternity. Do you believe that to be truth, church? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.